Star Trek The Return Written by William Shatner Narrated by Firehouse Gaming Copyright 1996 by Pocket Books Prologue He fell, alone, twisting through the air of Viridian Three. the shriek of the metal bridge echoing in his ears, spinning, the sun flashing into his eyes, the shadows engulfing him, one following the other, over and over as he fell. Light, shadow, light, shadow. Like the beating of wings. Like all the days of his life intersecting. In an Iowa cornfield, he sees the stars. A boy of five in his father's arms. I have to go there, he says. And you will, Jimmy, his father answers. You will. In Carol's arms, in their bed, even as he knows he must leave her, the sun they had created quickening with her. In Starfleet headquarters, Admiral Nagura reaching out to shake his hand. Congratulations, Captain. The Enterprise is yours. In Space Talk, Captain Pike beginning the introduction. Your science officer, Lieutenant Commander Spock. On the streets of Old Earth, squealing breaks, Edith, haloed in the headlights of her death. Th through all those days and more, alone he fell, hearing the whispers of the past. I am and always will be your friend. Damn it, Jim. I'm a doctor, not a bricklayer. Let me help. I've always known I'll die alone. Then one shadow blocked the light, broke his fall, ended the kaleidoscope of days. He turned his head, looked up, saw a face he recognized. Not from the past, not from the present, from the future. Did we do it? The falling man asked. Did we make a difference? The other, in his odd uniform, but with a familiar touchstone of Starfleet on his chest, knelt by his side. Oh yes, we made a difference. Thank you. Somewhere within him, the falling man was aware of pain, deep and incurable. Somewhere within him, he became aware he couldn't feel his legs, his arms, as if he and all of existence were evaporating together. The edges of his vision blurred, darkened, joined one final shadow deep enough to swallow whatever else remained. But the other, this stranger, this Picard, had offered his friendship. In another lifetime, perhaps it might have been so. So much might have been, so many possibilities. Least I could do, the falling man said, ignoring the final shadow for the sake of his friend, for the captain of the Enterprise. Voices called to him from the darkness then, their summons more than whispers. Through the lattice work of the twisted metal above him, he glimpsed the edge of something moving, coming closer. He closed his eyes. What was it he had said to Picard when they had met, when Picard challenged him to return for one last mission? He remembered. His eyes opened. It was fun, he told Picard. He tried to smile, to spare his friend. What lay beyond the bridge swept closer, chasing him as it had always chased him. Through the mangled steel, the shape was clearer now, closer, known. He gazed up at it, amazed Picard did not see, did not know. He tried to warn Picard, to help him escape what he no longer could. But the momentum of his days had crested. The dark well of his vision swirled inward, too quickly. And the face of that which chased him, caught him, and claimed him. The final wisps of existence lifted from him in a feathered haze of light, revealing all that lay beyond still to come. Oh my, he whispered, as he saw, as he knew, and then he fell again, alone. Chapter 1 James T. Kirk was dead. As Commander William Riker resolved from the transporter beam beside the grave of that Starfleet legend, he was surprised by the sudden thought that had come to him. Of all that had happened on the desolate world of Viridian Three only a month ago, inexplicably the fate of James T. Kirk weighed mostly, most heavily on his mind. Half a planet away, the shattered hulk of the USS Enterprise lay in ruins, slowly being carved into transporter loads of recyclable scrap 
by a team of Starfleet engineers. Though the ship was beyond salvage, in accordance with the Prime Directive, no trace of it could remain on this world. A primitive civilization existed on Viridian IV, the next planet out from the Viridian Sun. If someday voyagers from that world landed here, they must find no trace of advanced technology that might affect the natural development of their science. Riker had expected the full emotional consequence of the great ship's loss would have consumed him by now. She had gone before her time, and in his dreams he had always hoped to one day sit in her captain's chair. But in the days that had passed since the Enterprise had blazed through the atmosphere of this world to her first and final landing, Riker's thoughts still kept turning to the fate of the captain of an earlier Enterprise, the first Enterprise. Sir, is that him? Riker turned to Lieutenant Baru. The seam ridge that bisected the young Bullion's officer, Bullion officer's deep blue face pulled taut as her eye ridges widened. She looked into the distance, past the grave. Riker nodded, smiling inwardly at her reaction, recognizing the earnestness of her youth. The Farragut's chief of security had personally recommended Baru and three other officers accompanying Riker to be part of the honor guard to escort Kirk's remains to Earth. Riker knew what she saw, what they all saw now. A lone sentinel on a distant outcropping, the dry desert wind shifting the elegant black robes he wore. The reddening sun reflected the silver script embroidered on their folds. He had come, from Rob Romulus. Against all logic. Spock, Baru said with awe. Riker understood. He knew the Vulcan ambassador, had worked with him as a living, breathing individual. Yet Spock was as much of a legend as Kirk. As much of a legend as the friendship that bound those two on the first Starship Enterprise. The officers of the Honor Guard stood at ease, respectfully refraining from staring at the distinguished visitor. Instead, they faced the simple cairn of rocks Jean-Luc Picard had built for Kirk's remains. The setting sun drew long shadows from it and caught an old-fashioned Starfleet insignia pin with the gleam of dying light. Riker breathed the still dry air of the Viridian Desert. He glanced upward into the darkening sky as if he might see the Farragut sliding into orbit far overhead come to claim Starfleet's honored dead to bear Kirk home. From his sentinel's position, Spock remained as motionless as the time-smooth stones of this place. What could it be like? Riker wondered, to lose your closest friend, then 78 years later, lose him again. A hint of the power of that answer existed in the extraordinary circumstances that had brought Spock here. In fewer than four days, the crew of Riker's Enterprise had been rescued. Starfleet Intelligence had mounted an emergency extraction mission to bring Spock from the homeworld of the Romulan Star Empire to Viridian III, so he might accompany his friend on the on his final voyage. The extraction was not an operation to be undertaken lightly. Relations between the Romulans and the Federation had been strained for centuries. Spock had been instrumental in the efforts to reduce those tensions by decades of secret negotiations intended to reconcile the Romulans with the Vulcans and hence the Federation. Though the Romulans were an offshoot of the Vulcan race, they had rejected the logic which saved their Vulcan ancestors from succumbing to their primitive, passionate, blood-drenched beginnings. So who better than Spock, a child of emotional humans and logical Vulcans, to understand both sides and work for unification? Riker had spent many long evenings discussing Spock with Captain Picard. Both understood the process Spock was involved with was simply playing out on a larger scale of a struggle he had faced in his own divided heart. But whatever extraordinary actions Starfleet had taken to bring the ambassador to this world at this time, Riker knew that none of them would have been questioned, even given the Federation's need to officially remain ignorant of Spock's activities. Starfleet, the Federation, the galaxy itself, owed Spock too much to deny him anything, just as they owed too much to Kirk. On the horizon, the last radiant spike of the dying sun flared, then vanished behind a distinct peak. 
Overhead, stars emerged from the deepening twilight. Far away, Ro Rikers saw Spock bow his head, as if lost in memory. What would it be like? Riker wondered. A warm breeze stir stirred the small branches and dried leaves of the lone bush that shared the uh, sorry shared the outcropping. Lieutenant Baru caught Riker's eye. Yes, Lieutenant. Riker realized he had whispered in his inquiry. In the fading of the day, the forsaken plot of alien rock had become a solemn place. Sir, shouldn't we have heard from the Farragut by now? Riker tapped his communication badge. Riker to Farragut. The honor guard is in position. No response. We've arrived ahead of schedule, Riker told the lieutenant. The Farragut had been the workhorse of the rescue and recovery mission on Fer Viridian 3. Riker was not surprised the overburdened starship might be running late. We'll give Captain Wells a few more minutes before we sound the general alarm. He smiled at her. Lieutenant Baru was too new to her rank to return the smile. She nodded in once in silent acknowledgement, then returned her gaze to the cairn. Several minutes passed. The night grew darker. His communicator chirped. Riker smiled again at Baru as he tapped it. She was too tense. He'd have to talk to her about that. Not every day in Starfleet brought life or death decisions. Riker, go ahead. But his smile faded as he realized the garbled, static-filled call did not come from the Farragut. Commander Riker, this is Kilborn. We're... An explosion of static washed out the rest of the transmission. Riker held his fingers against the communicator, forcing an override. Kilborn was chief engineer at the salvage site. The honor guard stepped closer, on alert. Kilborn, this is Riker. Say again. Static whistled. Riker didn't understand the cause of it. There was nothing in this planetary system that should cause subspace interference. Then for a heartbeat, the static cleared and Kilborn's distraught voice cut through the Viridian night. Can't tell where they're coming from. Two shuttles gone. We need... Then nothing. Not even static. Riker's communicator chirped uselessly as he tried to reestablish a link. Riker looked at the four officers gathering around him. Their Starfleet training came to the fore. There was nothing youthful about their in the intent expressions they wore. This will have to wait, Riker said. He tapped his badge again. Riker to Ambassador Spock. A moment passed, then the deep, familiar voice answered. Spock here. Ambassador, there appears to be some trouble at the salvage site. I'm going to have to ask you to remain here while we beam back to check the situation. Of course, Commander, Spock agreed calmly. What is the nature of the trouble? I'm not sure, Riker replied. He looked through the darkness that now blanketed Kirk's burial mound to where he knew Spock had waited. But in his black robes, the ambassador was invisible. It almost sounds as if they're under attack. Spock did not respond. Logically, Riker knew he required no response. Riker to transporter control. Five to beam to salvage site. With Kirk's honor guard beside him, Riker tensed with anticipation as the computer-controlled satellite transport system reacted at once, energizing. In the cool tingle of the transporter effect, the gravesite shimmered. There was an unsettling moment of quantum transition, and then Will Riker beamed into hell. <laughs>